Okay. Uh, so my time is very limited here, and I uh, I want to focus in on recent evidence uh, that I think is evidence you can use uh, that has been established or confirmed by my own field research. Uh, however, uh, and so I'm going to do three things. I'm going to provide a very brief timeline of the transplant abuse issue because that as a as a writer, that's what I do is I put together a narrative. Uh, uh, and these are the things that I think are the most uh, important. Uh, uh, secondly, I'm going to focus in on one case study, which uh, which is the Oxu and the Green Lanes as the organ harvesting cluster, I call it. Uh, third, I'm going to give you estimates that are called from my recent refugee testimony, mostly in Kazakhstan, but also in Kyrgyzstan and to some extent in Tajikistan, uh, to provide the scale of the Chinese Communist Party's mass murder of Uyghurs. Uh, uh, here's what we know, uh, and this is, has, I'm not going to have slides for this, I'm just going to go through very briefly. Late 1980s, Chinese organ harvesting of executed prisoners becomes routine. 1994, there's the first report of live organ harvesting in the Rumchi area of Xinjiang from Nijat, a Uyghur security guard. 1995, Dr. Anvir Toti is ordered to extract kidneys and a liver from a live prisoner in the Western Mountain Execution Ground near uh, Aruchi. 1997, following the Gulja massacre, Uyghur political and religious prisoners are harvested on a small scale in Gulja and Arumchi on behalf of high-ranking Chinese Communist Party cadres. 1999, the Falun Gong persecution begins 2001 with approximately 2 million Falun Gong. That's my estimate in China. Falun Gong prisoners are singled out for what I call retail organs only examinations, and exam examinations which really go after the liver and kidneys and to some extent the heart and, and lungs. Uh, 2002, wait time for foreign organ tourists is reported to be two weeks or less uh, in many cases. 2003, incarcerated Tibetans and house Christians receive retail organs only examinations. 2007, Chinese medical establishment claims they're performing 10,000 transplants a year. 2012, individual Chinese hospital numbers, David went into this earlier, uh, revealed that China is actually performing at a minimum 60,000 transplants per year. 2014, Chinese police enter Falun Gong homes to take blood and DNA samples, literally cheek swabs, uh, compatible with tissue typing uh, and cross-matching. 2016, Beijing forces 10 million Uyghurs to give blood samples compatible, blood samples, that's important, not actually flat out, no, very few people report I love at that point, uh, compatible with tissue typing and again, cross-matching. Han Chinese are exempt from these medical tests, even though they're about half of the population. A few of my camp refugees did mention a dedicated DNA test, but it was very rare. None of my witnesses, however, reported receiving any follow-up medical treatment. 2017, camps are constructed in Xinjiang, capable of holding over a million prisoners. You, you all know about that, probably more than I do. Uyghur, Kazakh, Kyrgyz, Hui, and Falun Gong prisoners, there actually are some, uh, in Xinjiang uh, or East Turkestan are given bi-monthly health checks compatible with cross-matching for organs. 2017 also fast lanes for human organs, so-called green passageways appear in the Xinjiang airports. 2018, an order is given to construct nine crematoriums in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. The first completed crematorium hires 50 Han Chinese security guards 2020 field research in Central Asia, Asia is used to create an estimate of annual transplant volume. I'll come back to that. Let's move on to this current organ harvesting cluster in Aksu, Xinjiang. There it is. Uh, it's jumping around on your screen. It was big and now it's small. Okay. There we go. Now, satellite photos of an area like this can only tell you so much. The reason we actually can make full sense of this picture is through witnesses. Now, one witness was briefly in one of the two camps in this picture and spoke to Radio Free Asia reporter Gulchero Hoja about she brought me into the investigation of this site. Next slide, please. So, 
identify. There's two re-education camps. One is for 16,000 people and one is for 33,000 people. These are approximate numbers. We have a hospital, Oxu Infection Hospital, built into Camp 33. A kilometer away, we have, uh, to the north, a large crematorium. Next slide, please. There we go. Oxu Infection Hospital Camp 33 gives us a close-up of the hospital facility, which is outlined artificially in red. Now, the configuration of a prison attached to a hospital is not actually that new. We've seen several cases of this during the high intensity period of Falun organ harvesting and in several provinces as well. Uh, but I interviewed two witnesses in Turkey, and I believe their testimony sheds light on how this particular cluster developed. The first interview is from a Uyghur male who was in and out of the Aksu prison system from 1998 to 2004. And he recalls that the Aksu Infection Hospital was originally used for SARS virus patients. So that dates it, right? Uh, in 2013, he claims, the hospital evolved into a treatment center for religious or extreme Muslim dissidents. So the Aksu Inf Infection Hospital essentially became a re-education hospital. As we know from Mrs. Ms. Hojo's personal research last year, the Oxu Infection Hospital performs transplant surgery today. Now, uh, this witness, I can't give his name. He's got family back in, uh, in China. He also recalls that the first local prison camp construction in this area, in this region, began in 2013. That's only a five minute drive from the current Oxu compound. So they were already using this as a kind of dumping ground, if you will, for uh, political prisoners. Next slide, please. This is a close up of the crematorium. And this facility was also familiar to witness one. Uh, he pointed out that seen from the road, it has a prominent sign and the air smells like, and these were his words. I didn't even really ask him about uh, the smell, but he said the air smells like scorched bones. He assumed the scent was from Chinese bodies because Han Chinese prefer to be cremated. Now, I conducted a second interview in Turkey with a Uyghur male, also from the Aksu area. And this man drove by the crematory every day, and he identified it as such. He also mentioned a strong noxious odor coming from the crematorium, and he confirmed that the smell was a common among residents in the air and workers in the area. Therefore, even though we do not see visible smokestacks, the scent from the crematorium suggests that it does not use a water-based or alkaline hydrolysis method, as something that looks like pipes on the right side suggests, uh, but a burn method. That's intense heat filtration and presumably the burn process is eight times faster than a more environmentally friendly method. And I cannot give you numbers at this time, uh, but it is fair to say the potential of the crematorium to handle a large volume of bodies is much higher than we previously understood. Uh, next slide, please. The road to Oxu Airport, as you can see, it's less than half an hour to reach the airport. Uh, next slide, please. The Oxu Airport has international uh, flight capability. Uh, probably for medium-sized planes, but uh, it does have it. Next slide, please. And the Oxu Airport contains a human organ transplant for channel or the human organ export. The transplant hospitals new. No, all the green passages in Xinjiang slash to Turkestan are one only. Nothing coming in. Uh, the next slide please, shows uh, this shows what I did not too far from Shanghai has a big brother relationship with the Oxu Infection Hospital. And beginning in 2017, first hospital liver transplants increased by 90%, while kidney transplants increased by over 200%. Uh, next slide, please. Oh dear, that's right. That's that's going to be a little out of order. We're going to go next slide, please, because we're going to we're a little out of order here. So we're going to do. I might want this slide, please. Next, next. 
Uh, next slide, please. Good, there it is. Uh, on March 1st, 2020, first hospital successfully performed, wait a minute, go back. Go back, please. First, no, yeah, there we go. Uh, first hospital successfully performed the first double lung transplant on a COVID patient. Uh, this was uh, Wuxi People's Hospital. Also. We'll try to do this. Not clear uh, first, but uh, they. This was an advertisement uh, for the health crisis or pandemic. First and now, if you go back a slide, please. Back slide, please. Yes, uh, first hospital. No. China depends by ECMO training steps. I'm not going to get all these ECMO here, but uh, ECMO is used for live organ harvesting, and it can be used to double or triple the temporal viability, the time an organ is still viable before it is transplanted. Uh, now, let me move on to that. I want to go to what is what the scale is of this, uh, uh, which is maybe the most useful for people in this who are listening. One witness is on the next slide. I'm not sure if it's the next slide, but I want to be, I want to look at sorry, so sorry, okay. Um, thank you. Good. Okay. Sorry. And her husband talking to me, and that's the that's when I took the picture. Uh, and that went on for a lot. But the point is when sorry, girl, sorry, was a uh, teaching Chinese in camp. She was a Chinese teacher. Uh, she had access to access to a makeshift faculty lounge and following a camp wide health check, they held them every 2 to 3 months. A list with the health results would come back a couple of days later and uh, there in this faculty lounge, they kind of put the. Put the results up on a. The 3 of the names was pink check marks, maybe 3 or 4 of the names. And these were the people who would actually disappear in the middle of the night over the next 10 days. And I asked her why that would happen. And she said, organ harvesting. Now, several other camp refugees, I can't show them as they have a family in the camps, uh, gave me supporting evidence. A few days after the blood test, these were people who were not Chinese teachers. They were just inmates, if you like. Uh, after the blood test, the guards would tell several of the prisoners to wear a pink or orange vest in some cases, or the guards would affix a colored plant plastic bracelet to the people who had been selected. Uh, next slide, please. Now, to generate numbers, we needed a larger witness uh, sample size, and I'm starting to run out of time here, so let me summarize this. There are two kinds of people. The, the, the largest number of witnesses is in Kazakhstan by far. Uh, now that's recently been decreased and a lot of them have been sent back. Uh, so a lot of the people even in uh, a lot of the people I spoke to, I only have recordings for and they are probably we will never hear from them again uh, following the troubles in Kazakhstan. But the this was very uh, consistent from witness to witness. There are two kinds of people who leave the camp. The first are young people. They're about 18 years old. Uh, the announcement that they're graduating is usually graduating, which is usually made during lunch. They're going to be exploited for their labor at a factory out east, usually. Sometimes just picking cotton locally, but usually out east. The second group is aged between 25 to 35 years old. In fact, the average age is usually 28 or 29 the exact stage of physical development that the Chinese medical establishment has indicated they prefer for organ harvesting. Now, these people are taken away in the middle of the night and their disappearance is not acknowledged in any way. Now, based on this testimony from 20 apps, uh, if we go to the next slide, um, uh, you can see from the, you'll be able to see from the pictures how different the age groups are. That's actually uh, uh, Sarah Kshan and, and Bexat from uh, Atajura group, which really no longer exists. There's a good one. Uh, the average estimate was remarkably consistent among these between 2.5% to 5% annual disappearances. 
for this age group. Uh, now, and only one witness uh, described uh, no disappearances of that sort, and he was in a Kazakh only camp, and it was a very small camp. And so it appears that they were kind of going through the motions there. Uh, he also acknowledged that he didn't pay any attention to the Uyghur population at all. So uh, we really don't, he's, he's maybe the one witness which stands out. All the rest were quite consistent. Again, uh, uh, if you have 1 million Uyghurs in the camp, conservatively, my estimate is the 25,000, 2.5%. To 50,000, that would be 5%, average age, 28 years old, 29 years old, are being harvested for their organs every year. That is the number, 25,000 to 50,000. It's a range. I think it's probably somewhere in the middle, but I don't know. Uh, I'll start to conclude there. I want, I want to say something about evidence here. This, yeah, make no mistake, this will always be a tough issue. Short, no, please, please. Uh, Go back to that slide. I love, love, this, love that picture. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, short of a world war, I suspect we will not under uncover a final solution document from China. Uh, and we don't have shortcuts. We have to follow the evidence here. And some of the most critical and compelling evidence comes from witnesses, in my opinion, not just Chinese documents. Uh, now, Beijing, uh, and this is uh, dismissed Kazakh witnesses as propaganda actors. They've done it in terms of uh, they've accused women who who describe rape uh, as, as doing things. Well, I know that's not true. I've talked to the witnesses, and I, I can say that I'm, I'm no fool, and I know it's not true. And I imagine many of you have worked with refugees, so you don't agree with the Beijing in that point either. And I do want to say something personal, which is the Uyghurs working together have done an incredible job at raising awareness here. Uh, and it's been a privilege to work with all of you. And uh, please feel free to contact me with any leads you might have and uh, ways I can help you or uh, simply to talk. Thank you.